and uh, welcome to our second meeting of this season of BCSA meetings. Uh, and uh, since the start of this season, we've been on a high cultural plateau. The first meeting, for those of you who were here, I will remember, was all about uh, putting on Shakespeare in Prague. A very interesting meeting that was. Uh, and this evening, we're extremely lucky to have one of the leading authors in the Czech Republic, Yuji Hayecek, uh, and his uh, translator into English, Gail Kirky, who is from the United States. Uh, and um, as you probably read in the, uh, in the sheet we have, uh, Yuji Hayecek has uh, written several books, which have, uh, two books, which have now both been awarded the prestigious Magnesia Litera Literary Prize. Uh, and the first of those books was the one he's going to be mainly talking about this evening, which is called uh, Rustic Baroque, or Silsky Barocco, which is, well, I'm quoting here from the uh, sheet, which you'll be able to pick up over on the side. Uh, it's set in South Bohemia about a decade after the Velvet Revolution. Rustic Baroque recalls the tumult in the countryside during the 1950s collectivization of agriculture. It sheds light on the tall social fabric in the decades to follow and characterizes how Czech people of all generations struggle to come to grips with the unresolved remnants of their past since totalitarian communists were driven from power in 1989. So it's all about the collectivization theory. Uh, and uh, it's a rich and nuanced book, I understand. And it's translated into English, and you will be able to buy a copy over there uh, at the end of the, um, the evening. Um, Yishi Hayacek will also perhaps speak about his other, uh, more recent novel, uh, which is um, Fish Blood, interesting title, Ribi Kref, uh, which has also now won the uh, prestigious Magnesia Litera Prize. So it's a great privilege to have him with us this evening, talking about his work, uh, and to have Gail, who is his translator, to tell us all about, uh, set the whole thing in context. And uh, at the end of uh, their presentation, we will have a time for question and answer, uh, and uh, Yolanda very kindly volunteered to disappear, oh, there she is, to interpret for that. Uh, and uh, so there we are, we have a very good evening, and uh, maybe we'll get a glass of wine off, as we normally do. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Well, I guess I will, uh, I will sit, if, if anybody can't hear me, um, then uh, please uh, raise your hand and, and give me a wave. Otherwise, my voice is pretty strong. I think it probably won't be a uh, problem. If it is a problem, it uh, might be that my voice might give out because I've gotten a cold in the last couple of days. So if I'm blowing my nose once in a while or something, I apologize for that. But what's a person to do when gets a cold? So, very good. First of all, um, on behalf of Yuzhi Hayacek and myself, I would like to thank the British Czech and Slovak Association for having us here, uh, for making it possible uh, for us to be here tonight. And I especially want to thank uh, Julian Wild and Michael Ivory, I see Julian, I don't see Michael, he's here somewhere, for helping uh, with the arrangements uh, uh, to be here. Uh, for Yuzhi and for me, this is our first public appearance together outside of the Czech Republic to talk about Rustic Baroque. And so we're pleased that we could uh, do so with your group here this evening. Now I'm going to tell you, excuse me, one moment, sorry. I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, or I won't tell you the whole story of Rustic Baroque, but I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about it. I want you to, to read the novel in order to get the whole story. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about the book, um, about uh, why I think the, uh, the book is important. And uh, maybe it's a bit interesting to hear about how the book uh, managed, to appear in, uh, managed to appear in English. Rustic Broke is essentially a, a mystery story. 
that takes place about a decade after the Velvet Revolution has been mentioned. And it's set in the small villages within the South Bohemian countryside. The novel reflects back on the collectivization of agriculture that was occurring in the 1950s. But it also involves the period of restitution of property that occurred during the 1990s. And so it's a mystery story that connects the 1950s um, with the present day, while mixing in a little bit of romance, or sort of romance, uh, some history and some architecture. The main character of the book is one Pavel Stranyansky, who is a professional genealogist, and who ends up researching a family tree that probably in the end he, wished, uh, he might wish that he'd never gotten involved with. Now until Irzy Hayacek's novel Fishblood came out uh, last year, uh, Russick Baroque had been uh, uh, Irzy's most popular and most highly acclaimed book in the Czech Republic. And as has been noted, uh, Russick Baroque had won the Magnesia Lithera Prize for Best Book of Prose in 2005. Of course, Fishblood, uh, which won the Magnesia Lithera Prize as the best book in the Czech Republic from 2012, and this, in this case, the best book across all genre, um, was and is an even bigger success than in the Czech Republic than, uh, than Selsky Baroko or Rustic Baroque. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about how Rustic Baroque came to appear in English uh, and how I came to know Irji and uh, his wife uh, Nicole uh, as well. And I should note that uh, I've lived off and on in uh, Czechoslovakia and in the Czech Republic since 1992, uh, that my wife Regina is Czech and we have a small corporate communications firm in Brno, Czech Republic on the opposite side of the country from where Yerji lives, although it's not such a big country, so it's not so far, uh, that I quite like Czech beer and Moravian wine and Czech food. So you could say that I've been more than a little bit Czechified uh, over, the, uh, over the past couple of decades. Now back in 2006, one weekend I happened to be reading an article that uh, uh, came in the weekend magazine of one of the uh, local newspapers. I think it was Hospodowski in Albany. And there was an article about this bank clerk from South Bohemia who had written this highly acclaimed novel called Selsky Baroko, which of course is a Czech term for, uh, for Russian drove, and it's also the name of a unique uh, architectural style that's uh, found especially in South Bohemia. And at that time in 2006, the uh, novel had just won the Magnesia Litra. But it was, I think, Irzy's uh, personal story that really caught my interest there uh, when I first read that article. In part because we had certain things in common. We both came from rural backgrounds. Um, we uh, both had studied at agricultural universities. We both had worked in the financial sector. Irzy still works in the financial sector as a bank clerk. We're talking about trading currencies today at lunch. Um, and uh, we were both writers, <coughs> we were both interested in history. Now indeed, one of the things, uh, one of the areas that I had specifically studied uh, when I was doing some history studies at the university was the collectivization of agriculture. And I had studied the collectivization of agriculture, especially in, uh, in Ukraine and the former Soviet Union. Um, but over the years, while I've been in the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia, as I drive through the countryside in Bohemia and, and Moravia, and especially as a person who was actually raised on a family farm in the United States, when I look at the countryside, I ponder what this would have been like had collectivization never occurred in the 1950s. Um, I think about what it, what it would have been like then, and I think about what it would be like today. Um, as you may know, uh, been to the Czech Republic and driven through that part of the world, we typically have uh, big fields and big farms. And if there had never been collectivization, perhaps it would, uh, that countryside would be a little bit more like Austria, which has small farms and many uh, um, small fields that, uh, that divide those farms. So that's just one uh, example of how um, I believe that this, is, this collectivization has changed uh, the country and the countryside.
but it also had effects, uh, obviously, on the people and on the society in general. Um, so, um, as I started to, uh, to read Selsky Barocco in Czech, um, I started to get uh, more of an appreciation for the effects that uh, that, that collectivization then had on Czech society and the countryside. Now, for me to really truly understand uh, um, a book uh, like uh, uh, Selsky Barocco, as I read it in Czech, I needed to read it very closely and practically to uh, translate it and to think about it quite a lot. So I started doing that, and uh, the more I read in the book, the more I got excited about the book. And I really uh, felt like this is a book that really should be uh, uh, available in, in English. And so my wife, uh, Regina, and I got in touch with uh, Yerji's agent, and eventually with uh, Yerji and his wife, Nicole, uh, as well. And uh, we agreed that, uh, that I would start work on uh, preparing the uh, book in translation. Several years later, because I could only work on it as, uh, as, I, had, uh, as I had time to do so, uh, several years later the book came out in English, which was, uh, of course, last year in the fall. Now, of course, uh, uh, Irji's book, uh, both, um, of course, uh, uh, Selsky Barocco and uh, Rebi Kref uh, have been very big uh, successes in the, in the Czech Republic. Um, but the Czech Republic, of course, is a small market. And now we're, we're trying to uh, bring the book, uh, we are bringing the book to the, uh, the English-speaking uh, market. And the English-speaking market is a little bit tough. Uh, it's bigger, but it's uh, tough. Now, I'm biased, of course, but uh, I nevertheless think that Yerji has a good chance of being uh, one of the uh, Czech writers that becomes better known in the English-speaking world. And remember that you heard that here first. Now, Yerji's books are set in rural South Bohemia, and this may cause some people to regard him as merely a regional author. But if one looks more closely at the things about which he writes, one realizes that these subjects are in fact much bigger than just uh, South Bohemia. And I believe that that's part of what makes uh, uh, Selsky Baroko or, or um, Rustic Baroque an interesting and an important book. Now there are a number of things that make Rustic Baroque interesting. First of all, in terms of its plot, Rustic Baroque is essentially a mystery story. So in reading a mystery, it sort of takes a hold of the reader and one wants to know what's going to happen next, and one wants to know uh, what's going to uh, happen at the end. And there's this shady character, you'll be hearing more about him in a minute, or a few minutes when I read a bit from the book, a shady character named Shramik. Um, who's clearly up to no good. And uh, there's a beautiful young lady whose uh, name is Daniela, and she turns out to be uh, a little bit more complicated than she first appears. And there's a mysterious lady called Rosalia Zanlova, who had been a village beauty in her days uh, during the 1940s and 1950s in the little village of Tomashitsa, imaginary village of Tomashitsa, although here's you won't tell me where is Tomashitsa, but I suspect that it has another name uh, as well. Um, and then she became the center of some controversy during the 1950s when uh, the communists were coming to dominate over the villages and over the villagers. And at the start of the book, we don't really know what is the story of Rosalia Zanlova, but we find out uh, more about that as, uh, as we read on. Another aspect of the book that I think uh, makes it uh, um, interesting, besides its, besides its being a good story with some colorful characters, is that it helps us to learn something about the Czech Republic and the former Czechoslovakia, about its culture, about its history, and as well even a little bit about the architecture known as Rustic Baroque, for which the book is named. Now while these things make Rustic Baroque interesting, I think there is something else uh, which, in my opinion, uh, makes Rustic Baroque important. And that is, we've had some allusions to it already, that the book deals with the dramatic events that were occurring in Czechoslovakia during the 1950s, and the things that were occurring um, in, the, in uh, Czechoslovakia and former uh, Czechoslovakia during the 1990s. As in many other countries in Central and Eastern Europe, 
Uh, during the 1950s, the local communists, uh, with the backing and inspiration of Stalin's Soviet Union, were ruthlessly taking over the countryside in, uh, throughout uh, Czechoslovakia. And family farmers who had worked hard for generations to build up uh, something uh, were being forced to put their property into the collective farms. And the alternatives were imprisonment, were expropriation, were loss of uh, civil rights and basic human rights, including such things as uh, not being able to send their children to good schools, which uh, could continue for a couple of, uh, of generations. And so in some instances uh, and ways, society was completely turned upside down. The, uh, the rich were uh, uh, made, uh, made poor, put low, and some of the poor and lower class were uh, raised up and, uh, and made powerful. Now that situation, of course, reigned for 45 or 50 years. And then after the Belgian Revolution in 1989, that started to be set right. Or at least there were certain uh, um, efforts uh, in that direction. But uh, after five decades of socialism, the countryside uh, could not be returned to exactly what it was, and neither could the society. Those who had accumulated, accumulated power in the countryside and elsewhere, and sometimes wealth, struggled to hold on to what they had, or to take advantage of the new situation during the 1990s and 2000s to obtain even more. Meanwhile, there were those who were trying to get back the things that their families had lost, uh, but many were either too apathetic um, or too frustrated or were in various ways thwarted from uh, getting back what their families had lost. And Rustic Baroque helps us to understand some of that history and just as important to get a feel for the human side and effects that it has had on the social fabric of uh, the former Czechoslovakia. So the Czech Republic and, uh, and Slovakia as well. So, Take the perspective of the people, uh, some of whom are described in this uh, in this story today. They're trying to make decisions. They're trying to find their way in uh, in this new society. And does one simply forgive and forget about uh, what had happened previously? Does one try to settle old scores from 50 years ago and that have continued for uh, 50, 60 um, years since, or does one move on? Um, and how does one relate to other people who have perhaps uh, benefited from your own family's losses? And these uh, questions are, uh, are explored in, uh, in Rustic Pro. It's interesting to me that Irji Hayacek's writing examines these themes in a very non-judgmental way. So I would characterize his writing as realism, uh, we might even say naturalism. And he provides us interesting stories while trying to get us to, or encouraging us to think about the bad things that sometimes happen to people through no fault of their own. But he doesn't tell us what conclusions we should draw from this. That he leaves, uh, leaves to us. And his latest book, <coughs> The Ribi Kref, or Fish Blood, <coughs> takes a somewhat similar approach but uh, the subject is a bit different and the era um, in uh, which it's partially set is also somewhat different. Fish Blood is a book that's set in the present day, but in this case it reflects back to the 1980s instead of back to the 1950s, but still in the time of communism. And it's a story about what happens to people in villages in South Bohemia when their villages are leveled or at least emptied out for the sake of building a, shall I say, not so fictitious uh, giant nuclear plant. Because we can easily recognize the fact in reading the story that uh, this is the Temeline power plant that exists in, uh, in South Bohemia today. And yet fish blood is not an environmentalist novel. It's not a scandalizing expose of, of a huge injustice. Now, what it is, is a realistic view of what wrenching events do to real people and to real communities. And in this case, fictional but very realistic uh, people and communities. So fish blood 
confronts us as a reader with the reality of that day, the 1980s, South Bohemia, and again, their continuing effects today. And it lets us as readers draw our own conclusions uh, about what we make of, uh, of what happened in those situations. Now, Irzy Heimchek, of course, is a uh, writer from a small country, and we might say in a, uh, in a small language. And no matter how good a writer is um, that comes from a small country, um, and no matter how well he or she is known in, uh, in one's own country, um, it's a challenge to bring that book uh, to an international audience. The first thing that needs to be done in that case, of course, uh, to achieve uh, that kind of recognition internationally, is to make the book available in English, which we have done. Uh, the next steps are to tell people about it, which we're doing tonight, and, and of course to get it into the distribution channels, which is uh, probably the most difficult part of all. So, the, uh, while the book is very big in the Czech Republic, it's not so easy, frankly, to get uh, this book or any, almost any uh, Czech novel or Czech book uh, to be known in, uh, in the rest of the world. Because, for example, um, in, the, in the United States alone, there are several hundred books that are brought to the market each and every day. In fact, I did a little bit of research on this. Excuse me, just one moment. I did a bit of research on this, and according to the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, as we know as UNESCO, the U.S puts out about 900 new titles per day. New book titles per day in the United States. Uh, the Czech Republic puts out about 25 to 30 new titles per day. And just to make an interesting comparison, Iceland puts out about four, uh, uh, four new books, new titles per day. To put that in per capita terms, the Czech Republic releases about one new book for every thousand people um, each year, which is not much different than the United States, which releases about uh, 900, or one book for about every 950 people. And Iceland, is, which is a land, a great land of readers, as you've seen, has one new book annually for about every 200 people. And as long as I'm mentioning numbers, and uh, we're in the United Kingdom, I should mention that in the United Kingdom, about 400 books a day are published, and about, that comes to about one each year for every 420 people. So the point of all this is that there are a lot of books out there. And there are a lot of books uh, for people to talk about. So it's uh, not so easy to be heard. And of course, uh, at least in the United States, I'm not so familiar with the situ situation here in the UK, but there are more bookstores closing every day than there are opening every day. That doesn't mean that people have stopped reading books. Um, they're buying their books out, online now. And it means that it does mean that the channels of communication and the channels of, uh, of sales have changed. And uh, that has some advantages and some disadvantages, of course, in, uh, in distributing books. Uh, so far, I would have to say that we've had more success in promoting uh, the book uh, uh, Rustic Baroque in the United States than in the, than in the UK. Um, in part, I would say that's because we have targeted uh, sales of the book in the United States specifically uh, to people who have Czech ancestry. And in fact, there are several million of those people in the United States. And there are even uh, some communities, especially in Nebraska and Texas and Wisconsin, where I'm from, and other states, where there are still uh, communities of uh, lots of Czechs that are sort of repositories of uh, Czech cultural heritage. The book also has attracted a certain academic interest. And of course, there are millions of people who have gone to the Czech Republic, maybe lived there for short periods of time or traveled there. Um, and we're targeting these people uh, as well as potential uh, customers for this book. But what is a book, and in fact, any national literature as a whole, from a small country and a small language sphere to do in order to be noticed by the wider world? I think uh, an important part of uh, raising the recognition for Irzy Hayacek's writing is to create rec uh, increased recognition for the country's literature as a whole. 
Um, as we say, a rising tide raises all boats. And historically, um, and today, there's been a lot of interesting and good writing that has occurred in the Czech Republic. But also, the Czech Republic, I think, is a uniquely interesting place, as is Slovakia. Some would say Slovakia is even more uniquely interesting than, uh, than the Czech Republic. Strong argument to be made for that fact. Um, I'd like to point out another, er, an example of another small country, and, uh, and a writer from that country is an example of this. And I'm thinking about the case of Iceland and its 1955 Nobel laureate named uh, Haldor Laxness. I recently read his uh, 1957 novel, The Fish Can Sing. No relation to the fish pot. Um, and Laxness was a really excellent writer from a tiny country that makes the Czech Republic and Slovakia look like giants by comparison. Um, and yet he won the Nobel Prize and uh, his books were widely read. Now, does one read Haldor Laxness because he's in, he writes interesting stories? Or does one read Haldor Laxness because uh, he comes from an interesting uh, and colorful country, which uh, Iceland surely is? Well, I think it's some of both. Um, when one reads uh, Laxness, one finds out uh, something about the tiny country of Iceland, which is home to only about 300,000 people, smaller than the city of Berna that I'm, that, where we live. Um, Iceland is a country that's interesting beyond its, beyond its small size. And Laxness was a writer who was interesting beyond the size of his own country. And I think that the Czech Republic and Slovakia are also countries that are in some ways interesting beyond their size. And, uh, and I believe, of course I'm biased, that Irzy Hayek is an author that's interesting beyond his own country. Now, Irzy has been sitting here quietly, and we can't let that continue too long. So I'd like to uh, bring uh, Irji uh, into, uh, into the program a bit more directly. And uh, I'll do that in the form of a question and answer. And uh, we will uh, um, address a few more issues in, in that manner. So here's winning your Magnesia Litera, which recognized Selsky Baroko or Rustic Barot as the best prose book in 2005. This had to been a real milestone, a real turning point for your career. Of course, you'd already published four or five books uh, prior to that time. What did it mean to you back then to be recognized so profoundly for writing Rustic, Rustic Parole? And how did it change your life, or how did it change you as a person? Uh, who do you think? Do you think I'm not used to speak so loud. I will do my best, I promise. Yes, the novel Rustic Baroque uh, really meant a turning point in my career as a writer. Uh, I had uh, written another four books of prose before, and all of them had been situated in the Czech countryside. Uh, but uh, only uh, the theme of collectivization of agriculture in the 1950s uh, uh, resonated enough in the Czech book market and uh, in also in literary circles. Uh, the literary world, Magnesia Litera, uh, was helped by good selling, of course, uh, but uh, this novel got attention just after its publication in the fall of uh, 2005, uh, and uh, a lot of reviews appeared in the cheap newspapers and magazines, and, and I got a lot of letters and emails from my readers so I was surprised, uh, and uh, you know, what's the main reason of uh, this attention? I would say that this, this theme, this specific theme of collectivization of agriculture, uh, hadn't appeared very often in Czech fiction, even after the Velvet Revolution in 1989. And According to the reception of Rustic Baroque, uh, uh, it showed that uh, this painful part of Czech history was still living in society and in the minds of people. 
Now, Russick Brook looks back from a year 2000 or 2001 uh, perspective on the 1950s collectivization. Um, and of course, in the 1990s and the 2000s, there were also were huge challenges, or changes rather, going on in Czech society at that time. The old Czechoslovakia had been divided into two countries, and properties, uh, including farmland and houses, factories, and even castles, were being restituted to, to some people. And the Czech society was rapidly developing a capitalist market economy. Um, I think it's difficult for many outsiders from the West, as we say, to comprehend all of this, really. It's so far beyond our personal experience. How would you describe the feelings and experiences that people were going through in those times to somebody from abroad who really has little or no understanding of what was going on at that time and how it was affecting people? Uh, the inspiration for writing this novel came from my own family's past. Uh, and I think it is a good example. My grandfather uh, was a farmer during this period of uh, collectivization. And uh, at that time, uh, anybody who owned more than 20 hectares of land uh, was seen as an enemy of the state. And my grandfather had 24 hectares. Uh, he gradually went uh, from being a respectable member of a village, village community uh, to the so-called class enemy. Yeah. And it went quite quickly at the time. Uh, my father uh, was about 17 years old in the 50s and it had a traumatic effect on him, of course, which meant that uh, he didn't like talking about it. Uh, those uh, family circumstances uh, made me want to learn about it even more. Uh, so I uh, read uh, non-fiction books about Czech history, especially about 19. And then later I went to the archives where I studied the uh, uh, village older chronicles. And it was very interesting. Uh, you can really find uh, uh, human tragedies between the lines there. Uh, as uh, Gail said, uh, uh, the whole farming families were forced to give up their land in the so-called cooperatives. And the farmers were sent to jail for long terms. Uh, many families uh, were forcibly moved to another corner of the former Czechoslovakia. Uh, all these aspects uh, are in my novel, Rusty Farm. After the Velvet Revolution, the situation seems to be uh, very hopeful. The process of restitution was started, uh, but uh, not everything went smoothly. I would say, and uh, it took a long time in some cases. Uh, and imagine uh, uh, to begin farming after 40 years break, it was not easy for the people. Uh, and uh, in between uh, the face of the Czech countryside, and agriculture uh, was completely now, some people might say that Rustic Baroque, um, as, an, uh, as a novel that's set in South Bohemia, which is, of course, a small corner, we might say, of a small country, is just regional literature. Um, I guess I don't see it that way, but tell us about the bigger, more universal aspects of the novel, which could make it interesting for somebody, say, uh, living in, in America or, or in the United Kingdom. I would say uh, Rustic Baroque as a novel uh, deals uh, not only with the specific period of uh, Czech local history. Uh, it's a novel about uh, human interactions, about human and social memory, about uh, how people are dealing with their past. Uh, you know, I would say of course, uh, uh, there are many things uh, that uh, people around the world have in common. So I hope, I hope uh, that people 
can understand the novel written originally in Czech, uh, but dealing with general aspects of human life. Now, Rusty Baroque was published in 2005, and your next big uh, novel, Riki Krev, or Fish Blood, uh, for which you awarded your second Magnesia Litera, of course, came out in 2012. So I guess Fish Blood was seven years in the making, we might say. That was a, a long, fairly long period of time. From a commercial point of view, one might think that an author who has just won a big literary prize would want to rush out with another book as quickly as possible. But I guess that maybe wasn't your priority. So tell us uh, why it takes so long to produce your next novel. Yes, I must correct you, uh, There is still a book between Rusty Baroque and Fish Blood. It's not a novel, uh, more like a short story, uh, which was published separately in 2007, and its title is uh, Football Diaries. It's a story uh, written in a more relaxed way, and uh, let's say it's a sort of road movie, but set also in the Czech countryside. <coughs> a man who is start 40 and is up on the road with his sister, we had never seen before. Uh, it's a funny situation and a lot of things happen whilst uh, driving together for almost a week. But I have to admit that uh, this book uh, wasn't received very positively and failed commercial as well. <laughs> but back to your question. You are right that uh, I'm not the type of author who is able to churn out uh, books like that. I'm not able to uh, produce a novel every year. I just need more time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, will your Czech readers wait several more years to hear from you again, or do you have something to deliver to us uh, in a shorter period of time? As, as I said, I, I'm not a quick writer. Uh, for example, uh, for the fish bot, my recent novel, I spent a year doing research and writing notes, another year writing and another year editing the text and uh, you know I, I'm not a full-time writer I earn my living as you said as a bank clerk so I can write only on weekends on evenings or on holidays um, now the Czech Republic as I've mentioned is a small country with a small language spoken only by about 10 million people or 15 million if we include Slovaks who's uh, whose own language is generally regarded as mutually intelligible to Czech, of course. And for a small country, it has a strong literary tradition. So people know names like Karl Čapek, Jaroslav uh, Hašek, Bohumil Haraval, of course, uh, Václav Havel. But there are other great names that are not known at all abroad. How would you describe the situation today generally for Czech authors of fiction uh, in regard to being translated into other languages and being published abroad? And of course, I'm speaking especially about English, but I know that other languages are also important. And what has been your own experience in this regard? Yes, as you said, uh, it is not easy for an author from a small country uh, to gain an international reputation. Czech has always been a minority language. Uh, and uh, the Anglo-Saxon world has thousands of its own wonderful writers. But still, uh, there are a couple of Czech names uh, that are uh, well known abroad. Uh, for example, Milan Kundera, maybe, or my uh, most favorite Czech author, Josef Koreski. He died two years ago, but he lived uh, in Canada for a long time. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I would say I'm speaking about translations in English now. The situation uh, uh, within the frame of Europe or, or Eastern Europe <coughs> is a little bit better. Uh, I have translations uh, in Hungarian, Polish or Croatian. I would say uh, that the neighboring countries follow up each other's literature more closely because uh, their uh, historical experience is common. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, I, I know a couple of uh, writers of my generation who 
who have several translations in English, uh, mostly made uh, with the help of state grants uh, and published in, in some small university presses in the United States, for example. But if their books are really read by foreign readers in any great measure, uh, it's question. Well, let's hope that, uh, that you'll be one of those uh, re uh, writers from your generation that will uh, uh, become more, more widely known. I'd like to uh, take uh, just a few minutes and read a small selection from uh, Russic Baroque in, in English. And uh, I'm going to stand for this, I think. I read better when I'm standing. I normally read best when I'm standing and walking about, but I don't want to annoy you when I walk about. I know the gentleman running the camera doesn't want me to walk about too much either. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to read one of the uh, one of my favorite uh, parts of the book, which is actually the first couple of pages. And this is kind of a setup here. Uh, the book opens um, with uh, it opens in the in the park garden near uh, the castle in Chebon. I'm sure that uh, a number of you have been there. Very nice garden. Very nice city. And uh, our hero of the story, uh, Pavel Stranyansky, is sitting in the park with this uh, rather dodgy character by the name of uh, Mr. Shramik. And they're having a conversation there. So let's just listen in on what they're talking about. <laughs> and I hope I can read. <clears throat> oh, for God's sake, not this miserable place again. I just thought to myself inside. The sun was searing through the thin green leaves and the crown of the linden tree above us hummed with summer. Tourists, exhausted by the scorching heat, were plodding along the footpaths in the park, heading to the castle gate. Mr. Shramik sat beside me on the bench and just kept talking. I was looking forward to being within the coolness of those stone walls nearby and the weirdly pallid light of the research room, the muffled rustling of archival documents, the musty odor exuded by old books. A man has to pull every word out of you, he said. You shouldn't have come here again, I answered. But you know these villages, these people. For you it's just a matter of a few days, you said so yourself. So why don't you want to do it all of a sudden? I don't get it. I was flipping through the files he had given me, only in order to put this torrid and unpleasant interlude behind me. A few newspaper clippings, sheets torn from some yellow brochure, copies, copied pages of official documents. I repeated to myself the name of the village, and then the three family names, one after another. Yirka. Majanik. Yes, of course, Majanik. It's house number 11, two gabled farmstead on the square, well kept up. And across the way, there's that ruin that used to be a farmhouse with a vaulted gate, and it has a two story granary. A part of it's been knocked down, and the cooperative farm stores some machinery there. The barn's about to fall in, too. They call it the Yurka place. And the Kubach farm? I don't remember exactly just now. I can see that you have it all in here, Shramik said, tapping his head, his plump face brightening. Mainly in here, I replied, lightly rapping with the knuckle of my index finger on the laptop computer in its black case. Mr. Stronyansky, it's certainly somewhere at those farmsteads. We don't know where, but you'll find it. Someone may have it in some old shed around there, maybe in Chernobylka. I don't know. People used to keep such things. The old folks still come and sit about on the village squares there. Tomashits. Chernobylka. Smirchi. I was pronouncing the names of the villages out loud. It's like a swirl in a kettle, those farmhouses, surnames, godparents, christenings. I had a few jobs over that way some years ago. I think I even wrote about those farmhouses, but that was many years ago. Those villages are dying out, Mr. Shrock. 
He bent his pink, shaven pink face towards me. He was around 50, his hair already turning gray. Wide suspenders on his light summer shirt, shirt with short sleeves, chubby arms. I tell you, it's a letter. It's there somewhere, that much we know. Maybe there's even more documents. At the village hall, at the rectory, I don't know, you're the expert. You may find there's a whole pile of papers, in some cupboard or in an attic. He lowered his voice a bit more. And then, it would be a straightforward swap, Mr. Spronyansky. Just as I told you, papers to me, money to you. The sun was right above the Chebone Castle. I was kicking at the bench with my heel and my thirst was pleading for me to get out of there. It was difficult to swallow. I was thinking about the open spaces above and beyond the fields back home, about water and shade. But now I was in this pressure cooker. Shramik was prodding me to decide, to agree, and his hot, unpleasant shadow was pushing me into a place where I did not at all want to go. You know what? You should find somebody else. Mr. Stavanyansky, these things happened years ago. Who knows for how long that woman is already dead? There's no danger for you. I got up and stretched my back. He stood up too, sweat on his forehead, wet spots on his shirt. I handed him the things. Keep it, Mr. Stavanyansky. I'm going back again through Injiku Vradits on Friday. I'll come by. And he immediately carried on as if I had said nothing at all. Here at one o'clock, I was looking at the half-dry grass. It's a deal, he said, after a while. In fact, speaking just to himself. If you're not here, I'll come by and ring for you at the archive. So that's just a taste. And if you'd like to find out about more, a bit more about what Mr. Shramik has up his short sleeve, uh, and uh, maybe about the, this uh, woman who is probably already dead and can't possibly be any danger for Mr. Stanyatsky, I encourage you to take a read of uh, Rustic Broke. And we have a few uh, copies back here for sale for 10 pounds. And I'll also mention that uh, 10 pounds is too rich for your literary blood. Um, that uh, we also uh, have a special right now on the Kindle book at Amazon and uh, for uh, through next week um, it can be uh, purchased for one pound or, or one uh, dollar by going to Amazon.com or Amazon.uk. So with that, what we would like to do is open it up to you and uh, if people have uh, some questions or some uh, um, comments and, uh, and I would just encourage you uh, um, to make your uh, questions uh, uh, fairly, uh, fairly short and concise because probably, uh, well, we will have uh, Jolly uh, Thompson do some interpreting um, so that we're sure that uh, uh, usually understands uh, all the questions. Um, and if the questions are in Czech, we may have it, or Slovak, we may have it, we'll have it interpreted uh, as well. So, uh, who would like to start? Yes, sir. Bert. I'm going to uh, set the ball rolling myself. Thank you both very much for uh, uh, talking about uh, Rusty for Rock, certainly in a way which has whetted our appetite. Uh, and there's the book over there. I'm sure many of us will want to buy it. Um, but I have a question, and it's it, it's this: that um, it appears to be a book about the moral damage done to people uh, by the communist period, in this case particularly the collectivization of agriculture. And uh, I remember very well that when I was living in Prague in the mid-90s, um, Václav Havel, the president at the time, talked a lot about the moral damage inflicted on the country uh, by the communist period. My question is, how acute is that damage now? I mean, is it, is it decreasing? Is it washing out of the system? Or is it still very much there beneath the surface? And how much is it a theme in literature in the Czech Republic today? Are people writing a lot about that very broad theme? I 
I would say that uh, in the Czech literature, uh, many authors uh, go back uh, to the past, to the so-called big things of the past. So it means uh, World War II, 1950s, 1960s, 1968, uh, Soviet invasion uh, to the Czechoslovakia and so on. And uh, I am surprised uh, how few uh, contemporary Czech authors really uh, uh, is able to explore our present, our present time. And uh, there are a lot of articles in newspapers and in literary magazines and, and uh, uh, the critics uh, uh, are asking all the time why nobody really writes about the present time. And I would say there are big things in the present. You know. uh, but uh, maybe one of the uh, reasons is that uh, the present is uh, too complicated for, for an author or a man who is just living in this, in this time, so, so maybe uh, we will be able to describe or to depict uh, today's problems in 10 or 20 years, I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Okay. It may be, uh, um, and, and certainly there are, uh, there are authors that are, that are addressing these things, and, and a number of them uh, uh, who are with the uh, Publishing with the same uh, publisher uh, host that uh, that you publish with, um, and so there is there is certainly some, and my sense of it is probably that it's increasing a bit, um, but it's uh, maybe a bit still too fresh um, in uh, in people's uh, in people's minds, and um, and maybe it's difficult to. Uh, to extract some of that uh, from the people who were really uh, close to it, like uh, um, Yerzy's, uh, um, uh, well, of course, Yerzy's grandfather died when he was quite young, uh, but his father was sensitive about talking about it. And I think about, in my own family, um, something quite different, but uh, my father was uh, in the Navy in World War II and uh, was on the first uh, hospital ship that came into Nagasaki after the atomic bomb had been dropped. And in his whole life, never, ever talked about it. <laughs> ever. I never heard my father say anything about it. And uh, I think, uh, to a certain extent, some of these themes are probably still too sensitive uh, for people to, uh, to address. But I think more and more it is coming into the uh, uh, literature, and more the younger generation, would you say, Yuji, that's, uh, that is doing, that's writing about it? Maybe I could uh, say to this theme, uh, I agree with you that the moral damages are too big from the past and uh, uh, maybe describing the present, uh, we are keeping writing about the past. That's, that's Next question, yes, please, here. Yes. Um, Actually, first of all, I was interested in commenting on what, what probably the last two people have just been saying. Please do. But of course, it is also difficult in Britain to write about the present. It's not only a problem for the Czech Republic. I think less in America. Um, I'm much more aware of US novels which deal with ordinary contemporary life than, than the British ones. And also, going back to something, something before, um, uh, usually mentioned how the farming a situation in the Czech Republic between the 50s and now that changed. Of course, in, for very different reasons, precisely the same thing is true in Britain. Um, maybe not in Austria, as you mentioned, but, but certainly here. But sorry, that was, those are just things about. The question is about your book is about the character of Daniela. Why um, did you think it was important to, as well as all the other themes in your novel, to have this mystery at the end. Um, I, I might imagine you could have exactly the same novel, but without a mystery to be solved or a surprise at the end. And I wondered why you thought it was important to have 
we are still meeting with this young lady uh, who will hopefully be uh, contributing to the uh, records of the history of Czechs in London. And what she told me, and, and she, 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 is in, she intends to uh, aim her PhD thesis on the Czechs in exile, and she said that would be very good for me because everybody else is writing about, about collectivization. But that of course is uh, sort of uh, historical works rather than any, uh, any literature. Well, right, uh, back to my question. Uh, I think from some of your comments it was fairly clear roughly what the Goyvans were in the 50s, in the time of the collectivization. Uh, I have some idea, but not really very clear idea, what really happened after the 1989, what happened there uh, after the, uh, some of the pe people got back their possessions, uh, uh, what happened with the Czech agriculture? The, um, what happened, um, uh, well, yeah. let me uh, talk about what happened since that time and maybe reflect a little bit about uh, what was happening in the 1950s to, to, to my knowledge uh, um, throughout the country and throughout the region, in fact. Um, the, uh, certainly the collectivization was all over uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, in fact, collectivization was very uh, common throughout uh, throughout the, the region, the, the uh, Soviet bloc countries, as we call them. The one place where it didn't stick very well was in Poland, uh, where I think the church and the small farmers together were able to uh, to resist uh, uh, much that the communists uh, wanted to uh, to do there. Uh, but just about everywhere else, there was uh, collectivization, and it varied. I would say uh, I think you would agree that the in Czechoslovakia, the collectivization, as bad and as ugly as it was, was not nearly as ugly as it was, say, in Ukraine, which is an area that I study more in my, my historical studies, where there were uh, the stories that you read about the collectivization in Ukraine are so horrible that you don't know whether you, whether you even to believe them, because there's cannibalism, there's whole families starving, etc. The Czech Republic, I think that it varied quite a bit um, how things were community to community. In some cases, probably some of the farmers uh, who maybe didn't want to go into the uh, into the collective farms, but uh, but did so, um, maybe uh, became the new collective farm leaders. So, for example, my father-in-law, who uh, is from uh, from Arabia and would have been a teenager, I guess, after, uh, after World War II. Uh, and I've talked to him about uh, the collectivization, and, and he wasn't, didn't come from a farm family, but from a farming community, and he didn't remember it being so bad. And his, his memories of it were basically that the, the big farmers were still the big farmers, but instead of uh, being big farmers on their own estates, now they were the big shots in the, in the collectives. So, and uh, so I think there was, on a continuum, there was a whole range of things that, uh, that uh, possibly happened. Some places it was quite brutal, some places uh, much less so, I think it varied uh, community to community. Since that time, um, some of the uh, families have gotten the uh, land back, but as been mentioned, if you had farmed for 40 years, for example, I come from a family farming uh, uh, background in the United States, and my uh, nieces and nephews um, didn't grow up farming the way that I did. I grew up milking cows and driving a tractor. They couldn't possibly run a farm. I can't even imagine my nieces and nephews running a farm. And so somebody that uh, maybe 40, uh, uh, 50 years later, the parents say, you should go and run the farm. You can get it back now. Simply, in most cases, simply doesn't, doesn't happen. In fact, in my wife's family, um, there's a, uh, she's a cousin or an aunt or what she is exactly, but there's a, a lady who lives close to Berno and she has some land and uh, she's uh, recent, in the restitution she got some more land back 
and uh, she actually has a tense relationship with the younger generation. She's about 70 years old. She still has one cow and milks it, and uh, um, she has an, actually a tense relationship with, uh, with her own children and with her grandchildren because they don't want her on the farm. They didn't know how to run the farm. And so in many cases, uh, instead of people getting it back, they've simply sold the, uh, uh, the land into the collective farms, which have become, uh, either have remained as kind of cooperative or have simply become large commercial farms. Uh, and so a lot of that, uh, as you drive through the countryside now, you see the big farms. And uh, as you do in, in the UK and, and in America as well. In the UK and America, it's because of the, uh, um, the um, small farmers are just going out of business and the bigger farmers are growing all the time. But in a Czech, place like the Czech Republic, it's just because those big farms were created uh, in the communist times and they've, uh, they've continued. And in some cases, they're actually being uh, bought up by uh, wealthy, uh, uh, by wealthy millionaires and billionaires who've made their money uh, in the privatization of uh, state assets and now are buying pharma. But it varies uh, again; it, it varies. And foreign investors. And foreign investors. Uh, for example, in the, if you're a farmer in the, in the Netherlands, where they have to produce new land out of the sea. Um, and you're a farmer and you'd like to buy some land, you can come to the Czech Republic, and I'm encouraging everybody to come and buy land in the Czech Republic, but you, a Dutch farmer can go to the Czech Republic and buy land much cheaper than, uh, than he can, he or she can in, uh, in the Netherlands. So that's happening as well. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I remember seeing a long time ago a wonderful film, All My Good Countrymen, uh, and I don't know the Czech title for that, but I'm sure it's a very good film. Mr. Is that an accurate picture? Because for me, it was extremely moving and uh, showed me what hatred was created in very close-knit communities at that time. Yes, uh, I know this film, of course, is a wonderful movie. It was made in 1969, I think. 1969. Before 1969. Before 1969. And uh, uh, it uh, didn't go to the distribution uh, because after 1968 uh, this movie was banned uh, and it, uh, it was a common fate of not only of uh, movies but uh, of uh, many novels and many writers in the former Czechoslovakia. So, uh, but now uh, this film is uh, I can't say very popular in the Czech Republic, but uh, it is it is uh, playing again in, in, in Czech cinemas, and it is uh, very appreciated, very appreciated because it's a really uh, deep, uh, deep human story. And uh, I would, maybe I should explain your question. Of course, uh, the process of collectivization uh, was not the theme of South Bohemia, of course, it was uh, for people who are not familiar with, with, with the history of Eastern Europe. The process of, of collectivization was led uh, from the Soviet Union and covered all country, uh, all Czechoslovakia uh, during the 1950s. And uh, it took about 10 years. So let's say that in 1960s, Czech countryside and Czech agriculture was completely changed. So what happens with it now? But what happens now? The I, I, I would say that the big uh, fields uh, are still. Yeah, I think I think that uh, coming into the European Union has probably helped the uh, Czech agriculture quite a bit. But Czech agriculture went through a period after uh, after the 1990s and the privatization. Many of the um, many of the collective farms were actually uh, um, sold off or created into uh, corporations or remained as a uh, as a collective farm, and many many of them went bankrupt. Uh, farmers and families were able to take, in, in many cases, 
were able to take their land and some other property out of the uh, out of the collective farms, and so the farmers were the farms were stripped of uh, uh, some of their assets, and uh, so a number of them, uh, many of them, actually went uh, went bankrupt, uh, which is actually mentioned uh, also uh, in uh, in Rustic Grove, and uh, as when any uh, thing goes uh, bankrupt, but uh, you know, it's sort of bound in economically to continue. The land isn't going to disappear. That somebody buys the assets at a cheaper uh, at a cheaper price and uh, um, creates a business unit that's able to uh, to thrive. And uh, and so now there's, I would say, quite successful uh, agriculture. Um, and even under socialism, I would have to say the uh, <coughs> excuse me, the agriculture in the Czech Czechoslovakia was on a Eastern European basis was very very strong because they had big big farms and they could in, they could invest in, in high quality more or less high quality uh, um, technologies and equipment as opposed to in uh, in Poland for example they were still very many small farms and uh, their farmers would have two three four five cows and uh, they couldn't invest in in the kind of uh, equipment they needed for example cool milk. So it wouldn't get sour before it would be made into uh, dairy products, etc. Um, and so, in the communist times, it was relatively successful agriculture, relative to the region, and I think now it's becoming relatively successful again, also with the help of uh, EU subsidies. Just yes. a very small remark, if I may. Uh, sorry, I'm going to monopolize it. Uh, I have seen quite a lot of uh, former cooperative properties after. 1990 and then, uh, it, in all, most of them, perhaps all of them, say most of them, their state was absolutely shocking. The neglect, the running down, total lack of any maintenance, uh, uh, buildings which were once uh, looked after were in an absolutely awful state. Uh, I'm surprised that you say that it was relatively well run. In, in the, and we'll come over here in just a second. In the, uh, relative to the rest of, uh, of uh, Soviet <coughs> countries, um, I would say that agriculture in Czechoslovakia during communism was relatively strong. In the 1990s, these, many of these uh, uh, operations, farming operations, did get very, very much run down. Um, and if you drive through the countryside now, you can still see them standing. When I drive through the countryside, I can recognize what is a dairy barn, um, and what is a pig barn, and what is a poultry barn, and many of them are simply empty and, uh, and abandoned. Uh, we have one last question over here, and I'm getting the high sign, and we're going to have to wrap up. Yes, please. I just want to know about the question about the mystery lady at the end. Uh, in fact, I'm intrigued, and um, I think it's a great lovely book, and I'm really informally, that means whilst drinking wine, um, so we've reached that point now and I hope that uh, any other questions can perhaps go to, uh, go to uh, our uh, guests uh, in that way. Um, I'm sure that they can hardly believe that they were in Prague this morning and now they're in the Slovak Embassy and they have conducted everything in English. Apologies to our uh, translator. <laughs> um, so it's been a huge effort for them to, uh, to be here, um, and we do appreciate that very much indeed. It's not often we get the chance to meet um, such an eminent writer as yourself, so we're absolutely delighted that you've been here. Uh, and I'm sure that I'm speaking for other people when I say that you, you don't need to be anxious about your English in future, and that when you go to Sydney and Washington and New York to do this, uh, then you'll be absolutely fine to do it uh, in English. So can we thank our guests very much for you.